So again, welcome. And our talk today is about deciding to start a heritage language school. So my first question for you, Nina, is why do you think you should consider starting a heritage language school? Well, uh, as a newcomer, you know, you come to the culture that is completely different from your own. I grew up in Slovakia and when I was uh, 29, I made a decision to leave Slovakia and come to Canada. And uh, opening heritage school later on, of course, when you survive as an immigrant, uh, gives you a great opportunity to learn how the society uh, and cultures work on the other side of the world. So it opens up great possibility for networking, socializing, and that was very important for me. Uh, and once the school opens, you realize that your school also becomes sort of a first responder to people like you who are immigrants, newcomers, or even students from abroad, or professionals who need to improve the language. So that gives you really a great feeling that you can help these people and altruism that you can disseminate around you is something that is a huge motivator for me. You know, uh, I, I study history and I deal with uh, some serious issues in society these days. And um, basically for me, building dem democratic citizenship is another um, important uh, factor that plays a huge role. Um, because once you know your own roots, you know your own culture, you respect your own culture, you start to build respect of other cultures as well. And that is absolutely the basic start for um, positive uh, relations in the society with other cultures. So you build multiculturalism and let's say peace on earth <laughs> to, be, to be more generous. But um, uh, yes, it, it is important because you, by defending your values, you defend the values of others. And that's, that's extremely important in Canada. How about you, Trudy? You opened your own school. I opened well. um, Chung Lak Hong Viet, um, Vietnamese school as well. I wanted to have a place, my daughter is Vietnamese, and I wanted her to have a place where she could learn how to embrace her Vietnamese-ness. I originally thought, oh, I'm going to put her in Saturday school and she will be completely bilingual. Um, the, the language learning part hasn't been as fast as I had hoped but there is still cultural knowledge that she has that she wouldn't have otherwise. There's learning to be around a group of peers, um, people from the same culture that's really important as well. So for me, it was essential that I gave her that in a way that I could not, as a mother who's not Vietnamese, could offer that to her. So she attends, she attends Heritage Language School every week and I too am a part of that school. I'm the president of that school and I work in the kindergarten classroom. And I, I totally believe all of the things that you've said. We talk in our school about the importance of democracy, being Vietnamese Canadians. That's very important because many of the Vietnamese Canadians who are here came here in search of democracy. So that's, that's a key element for us as well. Plus it's important to have a group of connected people around you. These are kids, mm -hmm. they grow up, they're not transient. They go to heritage language school from the time they're little and they stay and remain friends with that same community throughout their whole lives. So they grow up together and it's a beautiful thing to see. So it's not without its challenges, but it's in my opinion, it's definitely worthwhile to have a heritage language school. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Okay, so let's move 
move on to our second question. Mm -hmm. How do you finance a new school? So you've made the decision to start it. Where does the money come from? How much do you need? Oh, of course, I had a million in my account. No, I'm just kidding. We started from zero, <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, this is something from for people, a message for people who want to do something big, but do not have money. There are always a ways how you can start uh, a, a bigger project. And it involves lots of negotiation, lots of diplomacy, and uh, keep always in your mind, simple question. You need to talk to a different institution, but go there, not only with your request, but what you can offer to these people. So let's say we needed, a, we didn't have any money, really. I couldn't, I couldn't go to the bank and ask them to, to give me $100,000. It was impossible. So I went to the local church. And of course, you know, church communities are, are small. They are very supportive. They understand that you have troubles. So they gave us a very symbolic um, uh, amount of rent to pay a monthly. And then I was like, OK, uh, we have a rent to pay. But um, you need that source of the money. So you reach out to different communities. I reached out to Slovakia Edmonton, who run casino money. And they always uh, look for other project to support. So there was that, that became another source of our money. I reached out to Simil Slovak Heritage School in Calgary. We discussed this project and we um, concluded that it would be really good if we, if we cooperate because we can cut our insurance. In. And then I reached out to another organization in the church. Um, this was a play day program who had all the school supplies, uh, toys, um, you know, some can use as well and I offered for very symbolic money okay we can pay for this and in turn we can also provide you this kind of help that kind of help so it really involved four institutions discussion with them about what we can offer even if we don't have any money and we really run on a tiny little budget we are a small school in comparison to other schools like Polish school or, or Ukrainian or, or other schools we are really tiny but it works but it really about negotiation, diplomacy, and what you can offer to, to these communities. That's very interesting. And I, have, I have a somewhat similar story. So in my case, when we started our school, we had very, we had no money as well. We were a group of four women who decided that we wanted this for our children. One is a retired teacher, two are mothers of young children as well. And so we decided that we would not pay our teachers, that we would be the teachers in the school. We would volunteer our time. We would take the tuition, whatever tuition we had, and that tuition would come, would help us to pay our rent. We were very grateful in the early days to be able to pay rent to the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers. They allowed us a space where we could go into their school and we could, we could use their classrooms. That's not without its disadvantages as well because we're working in somebody else's space. But uh, eventually we negotiated with the, Ed with the Edmonton Viets Association or Hoi Nui Viet, and they allowed us to use their, their space. So we too are always thinking about what we can do to offer Hoi Nui Viet to keep, to keep us connected. So we make sure that we participate at their festivals. We make sure that we clean up after ourselves. We take care of our space. We let, leave posters for them. We try and encourage to bring new members into the Vietnamese community as well. So there's always that trade-off. Uh, we were lucky in the situation of our school because I managed to get my parents to donate a bunch of Chromebooks and we had an old TV. So out, because we have a dedicated space, which is something not a lot of heritage language schools have, we can set up that TV that we use as a projector and the kids can play games over the internet. So that's really great. And we're also very lucky that we have a closet that we can store stuff in. So it's worked out very well, but yeah, there's a lot of initial costs and to try and get that money before you actually have a school is quite difficult. It is, I agree. <laughs> so. Okay, here's, here's our next question. So, what do you think your main costs are when starting a school? What do you think you have to figure in to pay for? Well, of course, the main cost is the rent and insurance. Um, 
as I said, we were really lucky. If it wasn't for um, Slovakia Edmonton, I don't think we would be able uh, to run or we could run, but the school fee would be much higher. So it really comes down to, to the school fees. And my philosophy is uh, the smaller the fee, the more students you can have. So I'm trying to keep this on minimum. And this year we tried a uh, drop in system. So the students do not have to pay monthly or yearly fee. Uh, they come whenever they can, and they just pay a very symbolic price for uh, joining our classes. And depending if they have siblings or not, uh, more siblings means even lower fee. So that means, um, you know, I have really small amount of money to pay to teachers, but I have such a dedicated team of fantastic, fantastic crew. Um, they are completely dedicated. They don't want me to pay any honorarium to them. So I can save money that I would normally pay to my teachers. It's volunteering and passion for them. So that's what keeps our tuition really at minimum. It's currently actually $10 for a one session uh, for one child and $15 if um, there, there are two siblings in the family. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned insurance. How did you go about getting an insurance policy? You've already talked about the rent. Yeah, so insurance policy was something I discussed with uh, other school in Calgary. Uh, Slovak school in Calgary opened two years before we opened and um, um, you know, there was that entrepreneurial spirit on their side, an effort to save money. So they suggested, okay, how about we join together, we create two campuses, one campus in Calgary, one campus in Edmonton, and we will pay one insurance. So insurance was about $1,400, which is, uh, I mean, even more because we pay, now we pay each $800 of insurance, which is still lots of money for us, but it's far less than uh, you know uh, 1600 and i know you just have to really do your search because different insurance companies offer different um, insurance policies but when you're a busy mom you really don't have so much time to do this so i relied on the on, on advice of uh, school in calgary and that's what helped us but i'm sure there are probably better deals so what do you look for when you're looking for an insurance policy you know, if you read through the policy insurance, there are, there are so many factors to consider. And I had no idea. It looked actually scary. So my advice to people who want to open heritage schools, please don't get scared, uh, but be wise about the building you choose for your school. Make sure that you choose the building that already have these policies in place. For example, the church, of course, is insured because there are uh, daily gatherings of, of um, people uh, on a you know, uh, quite frequently. So they the building has to be in really good shape. They just installed a new elevator two months ago. It has to be accessible for people with disabilities. It has to have walls uh, that can sustain fire to a certain degree. So all of these um, factors are important when you are choosing the place for your heritage school. And that also relates to the cost of your insurance. Now, our insurance is probably more expensive because it also covers me as a principal. Um, if I do some kind of mistake uh, on a, you know, administrative level that is causing, I don't know, some essential problem, I'm covered. My insurance is covering me for, for you know, and that's also, it gives you a peace of mind because you are basically running an institution. It doesn't matter that it is small. In our case, it's really small, but it's still, it is officially there. It is written in the books. So you have to make sure that you are covered on all fronts. So what would your advice, if there were a school, if there was a school that was saying that they didn't need insurance, what would you say to them? Uh, do you know what we have? Uh, as I said, we are tiny, small, but even then, do not risk it. Go with the insurance. You never know what will happen. You never know, uh, you know, what kind of situation you will be exposed to. And especially these days, um, you know, parents can take you to the court. Mm -hmm. You might be on a friendly relations, but you never know. It depends on the seriousness of the situation. Just seek that backup no matter what. And insurance is probably the most important one. 
okay. go to the field trips, you know, anything can happen on the field trips. If you are, uh, you know, I don't want to make up these scenarios, but there is an accident, police comes, you know, there is the whole thing of the avalanche uh, situations that can put you in a trouble and you don't want that. Right. So make sure that you are insured no matter what. Do not open your school without insurance. That's my well, advice. As a historian from ELA, I have never heard of anything happening against a heritage language school. Having said Good. that, <laughs> I the risk of not having insurance. I, th I think it's essential. Some of the other costs that I think of, um, our school provides snacks for children, so we have to cover that. We have to pay honorariums for teachers, and we have to have new upgrades in, in not only technology, but just in books and materials in general. Okay, this is great information, I think, for people who are considering starting a school. Let's move on to our next question. What should you look for in a space? We touched on a little bit about this, but you might have better ideas. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as space is concerned, um, it depends really on your pedagogy. So if um, you for traditional uh, pedagogies when, you know, students are mostly sitting and doing activities at the table or behind the computers, you need a different space. We um, implement project-based learning and for project-based learning we really prefer a space that is bigger allows us to move with little furniture uh, and lots of flexibility so um, before you search for the space ask yourself what are my goals what kind of what kind of teaching i want to implement and you truly you do the similar things you do project-based learning as well yes um you have small students that's another thing um, contemplate the age group. The smaller kids need to need to move. It's it's a part of psycho hygiene. So they won't be sitting behind the table for an hour or two. So you need that space to move. I know that there are some heritage school, schools functioning in tiny spaces, but um, it doesn't it doesn't work for us. I, I need a bigger space. So um, another thing is you've mentioned storage place that it was a huge benefit. Trust me. I wish we could have a bigger storage space. You know, you don't think about storage space. Oh, what's we have bigger issues to to worry about, but it, it is actually a problem because every single uh, session I have to load my car. It's literally two big boxes, and I'm traveling. <laughs> you know, from what I'm bringing everything basically with me because we don't have we don't have uh, too much storage space available at the church, and it it makes a huge difference when you have it. <laughs> I think you have your own experience with that. I have my own experience with that. I had a van and I had eight plastic tubs in the back of my van. And I called myself like the Vietnamese library because I was walking yes. around with books. If you want kids to have just books to look through and to do, to do different kinds of reading, you have to have books. And that means somebody has to bring and carry them in. And so you develop a lot of muscle power doing that. But I agree. <laughs> on the other hand, you'd probably not want that wear and tear on your car. So if, if you could avoid that, that would be great. I think with spaces, there's there's the dream space and there's the actual space. And so I think sometimes people have to prepare themselves for the reality that they're not going to get everything that they want. Mm -hmm. And in the dream space, you would have well lit, a well lit well-lit classrooms, you would have a park nearby where the children could run, so you could take them outside for recess. You would have you know, ample storage space. You would have bulletin boards that you could put up for, for what's available. You would like the children, to, for each teacher to have their own classroom with their own materials where you're not fighting over pencils and things like that. But in reality, you, you have to take what's available. Um, I highly, some of the schools in Edmonton, early on, they think the best option is to rent space from one of the public schools or one of the Catholic schools. And sometimes they're allowed to do that, but that rent can be very expensive and it mm -hmm. can prohibit the actual operation of the school because if all of your budget 
goes towards rent, then you have nothing else for teachers and program development. And so that's that's another factor too. You have to consider what you are really able to pay for. And so if the parents are prepared, if the parents really want to be in a public school building where they have access to the gym or to the park outside, then that means you have to have tuition fees that the parents are prepared to pay for those things as well. And that's not always the case. So it, it's a, it's a yeah. double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And finding a space is probably the biggest challenge, I would think, to starting a heritage language school. Would Definitely. you agree? Is. Oh, yeah. Definitely. If it wasn't for the church who made us really generous offer, pay what you can the first year, we wouldn't be able to start at all. So, so yeah, we're we're in a very fortunate position with the Edmonton Beats Association. They're very generous with us in so many ways, um, and we owe them our gratitude because without them, we would not have a, we would not have a school. So, mm -hmm. I, I understand what you're saying. Here with this question, how do you know how much tuition to charge? Because you've you've had to work around this with your school. Yes, I think we partly answered this question because first, of course, you have to. It starts with the rent, then insurance, then uh, with the dedicated teachers. Uh, if uh, you have to consider honorarium because they are working extra hours, they commute from different areas of Edmonton. So they are actually actually already spending money. So something symbolic for them, um, you know, would be appropriate. And then at the end of that chain, of course, you have to reconsider the books, uh, maybe a field trip here and there, um, school supplies. And then at the end of all of that calculation is, okay, so what kind of tuition I need to make this happen? But as I said, I kind of twisted it around and I start with the premise, the lower tuition, the better for a community. So, okay, what do I need to do to keep this at ten dollars? <laughs> and that's a biggie. <laughs> so it just and for us because we don't have uh, uh, too many, too much money on our bank account, it's really about going out there, networking, negotiating, and offering what we can do instead of offering uh, cash. So. It is lots of work if you want to keep your tuition minimum. I, I think it's difficult to know that. And it, part of it also has to do with what services you provide. I would argue that all schools should charge something. Yeah. Some schools try to try to go tuition free. But I think when you do that, then that shows that you don't necessarily value the school as much as you should. So I think there should definitely be some form of tuition. But I guess it comes down to what is your community able to pay? Because some some communities have wealthier families and they could probably afford a much higher tuition than other schools, right? Mm -hmm. So I new agree. immigrant families would have less money to pay for a Saturday school mm -hmm. than perhaps a really established community. And we also have to reconsider uh, what is happening in the society. So uh, with uh, situations like crisis, economic crisis, or what we are dealing right now, uh, of course, there is a expectation that these families would be under economic you know, hardship. So you don't want to uh, be a pain and ask for more tuition. You have to reconsider societal and economic factors when you are um, trying to establish the amount of tuition. Right. In our community, we charge a certain amount and we provide a lot of services, but where our priority is the community's children. So if somebody came to us and said that they didn't have money, but they really wanted their children to attend, we would definitely make room for that family. And I'm sure that you have a similar situation. Yeah. Okay. So here, how, now this is a tough, tough question and interesting, particularly for you, because you've, in your small time in your school, you've had lots of different types of curriculum. So how do you go about developing a, a curriculum for your heritage language school? Yeah, so here the most important thing is, and uh, sometimes it's a headache, because you have uh, different age groups, uh, which is basically from three years old to 12 years old, which is a huge mm -hmm. span. Then we have adults. Um, which we were surprised because we originally opened the school for, for kids. 
And then I received all of these emails, okay, do you offer classes for adults? So that's a completely different story. So we created the class for adults and then we created one, basically two classes on, uh, on two age groups, the smaller and the older kids. Mm -hmm. But we figured, okay, we don't have too many teachers. We have only one big space with a one attached tiny room. So basically mm -hmm. your number of classrooms, the size of these classrooms, pushed us into creating um, super efficient curriculum where at the beginning of the sessions we divide uh, the older and smaller kids and at the end we put them together to work on the project. And okay. it took time to work this out because, you know, it also comes down to the expectation of parents. Uh, mm -hmm. Parents who want their kids to socialize. There are parents who want their kids to pass the exam in Slovak language, for example. There are parents who want really strict system and experience. You will sit down and study no matter what. So we had all these kind of parents together. And then, okay, so you want to meet and the students who want to experience, have fun and, and be happy that they are in at school. Uh, so that was a big problem. And we came to conclusion that project-based learning will address all of these streams of desires. But to be honest with you, we started with PBL and there was mm -hmm. some pressure from the parents on us to be stricter, do more grammar, do more this, do more that, like more sit down activities other than communication activities. And that's, you know, related to their own experience when they grew up during the era of communism and mm -hmm. a very different style of learning, as you know. So they were pushing kind of that on us. And then we realized, okay, so now we are fulfilling the uh, expectations of the parents, but our students, suddenly the level of enthusiasm went down. And then I decided, okay, this is not going to work. Students are our priority. We are switching back to full-fledged uh, PBL. And that's what we did, because I want my kids to be ready at the door on Saturday. Yay, so cool. And that was the first year. And we switched to more, more stricter curriculum. It didn't work. And now we transition back to, to, to our PBL because kids enjoy it and they learn. Um, you know, writing uh, comes at stages. We run on Saturdays. We don't run every day. So these are the factors that's, that parents have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. How do you, Trudy? So how, how do you guys develop the curriculum? I think you said you hit some very important points. Saturday school or heritage language school is a bonus for children. And so parents that think that heritage language school should be an extra school day out of the week for children, it's a little bit unfair to them. And so we need to respect children's time and desires and ambitions. Mm -hmm. At the same time, children are there, they want to learn as well. So we need to create an environment where they can learn. I had the opportunity to take my daughter when she was in grade when she was in grade one, back to Vietnam. And when I put her in Vietnam, in, in school in Vietnam, she had private lessons. And the teacher was very strict. She had three children at the table. The children sat at the table and copied for one hour out of, out of, an, out of a 90 minute lesson. The teacher mm -hmm. had a half hour one-on-one -on -one with each student. And then while, the other two, while she was working with one student, the other two sat and copied. All of the children in Vietnam did that because that's what the culture of that country supported. Those same mm -hmm. children, my daughter who would not sit at a table and do work in Canada, sat at a table and did that in Vietnam because that was Vietnamese culture. But in, in heritage language school, we kind of have a hybrid culture. It's not purely Canadian culture and it's not purely Vietnamese culture or the the other countries culture as well. So we have to de design something that works to meet our students. Mm -hmm. Our students very rarely have the intention of going to work and live full time and study in university in in the former country. Most most Vietnamese parents would want their children to attend university in Canada. Mm -hmm. So we're not preparing students in, in our school, anyways, we're not preparing students to go to Vietnamese university. 
We're trying to give them some literacy so that they can read Vietnamese stories and keep connected to their culture. We're trying to teach them oral language skills so mm -hmm. that they can participate with their families. And we're trying to keep them happy and engaged in the community. And so things have to be fun. We too found that project-based learning was the right way for us, but other schools might do things differently. And that's okay too, provided that's what the community and the children want. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, okay, so here's, here's a very tough question. How do you attract teachers? <laughs> See, uh, as you've mentioned today at the beginning, uh, you mentioned that you were four dedicated women, I assume good friends, who had yeah. the similar issues, um, similar challenges, and the very similar scenario in our school. I had a friend uh, whose, whose husband is Canadian, and when the kids were little, she was very concerned that their, that their kids wouldn't speak Slovak, they would speak only, only English. My kids, me and my husband are from Slovakia, both of us, but still we could see uh, that our kids are picking up uh, English so fast, they don't speak Slovak at all. And I put them in a French immersion, which is additional language, plus they understand a bit of language. So I'm trying to push as many languages as I can on them. But that dedication from your friends with the similar issues, it gave me an idea, okay, how about we create a school that is basically a place for socializing? And from there, so it's socializing for the kids and for us. So on Saturdays, I love it. I'm exhausted, to be honest. I have a full-time academic job and three kids. On Saturday, all I want to do is sleep. But then <laughs> that drive that I will meet my friends, even we can shed only really 15 or 20 minutes to have a coffee and see ourselves without makeup. We just, you know, go like that but we find that boost and energy to go and to chit chat a bit. So it is for us, for me, it's, um, my teachers are part of my family. Um, they don't want any honorarium. They, they, they understand what is this about. It's not about money. So the message for those who want to open school, if you want to do this for, for profit, don't even think about it. <laughs> you will not profit from heritage language school. I know there are many people who believe that probably I am, I am, I don't know, I must be a millionaire because I, I opened a tiny school. No, for Christ's sakes, if my husband knew how many, how much money I invest into, you know, from my own pocket, he would probably close it himself. <laughs> so it's not, no, don't, don't do it for your profit. But if you find these dedicated people that give you energy, no matter what, then open it. It's, it's worth it. And then you create these com community events, like for Christmas or Easter or any kind of cultural celebration you have. And you meet these people in a different scenarios. It really reminds you of times when you grew up and was little and it, you show, you display your culture to others. So what, what's better than that? I agree in the sense that so many things you've said resonate with me. I have often said that if I considered all of the honorarium that I have been paid for developing Heritage Language School, by the time I pay for all of the materials that I've bought, and by the time I invest my time, I pay about $20 an hour to work there. So <laughs> I, I agree with you that this is never going to make you, probably ever going to make you money. Um, some schools might, might be different. When it comes to teachers, I think you've hit the nail on the head that we want to attract teachers that have dedication and passion and really want to teach. There, but much like rent, there's the ideal of who you want and then sometimes the reality of who you get. And that those things are not always compatible. Um, preferably, you would, you would like people who have really strong language skills Mm -hmm. And you would prefer people who have children or an investment in the community. So um, how do you get those people to want to be with you? I guess it's develop a friendship network. I guess that's our, our best answer for the moment, especially in the early days. Exactly. If it wasn't for friendship, they wouldn't be there because there is nothing else you can offer. So it's... Uh, it's um, and creativity, you know, it, it, school gives you so much opportunities to be creative. So if you are into arts, into community events, into um, anything related to human mind development uh, and interaction, 
that's the perfect platform for you uh, to be in. So I really found uh, these, uh, this team of fantastic ladies and we have support, of course, from their husbands as well. So it's, it's, I love it. I love that group. I, I, I can't imagine my life without them at this point, really. I have to say that there's also benefits to this too, right? Even though I don't speak Vietnamese very well, I did get the opportunity to spend a lot of time with friends, but I also, it was self-esteem boosting. I was working on my PhD at the time and to go in every weekend and to have kids that are excited to see you and have something you want to work on that you can be successful at is a great feeling. So it's, it's definitely worth it. So, okay, let's move on to our next question. How do you advertise and attract students to your school? Yeah, so thanks God we live in a <laughs> age of social media. So you just open your Facebook account, Facebook page. That's what we did because we honestly, we didn't have money for fancy websites uh, at the beginning. But now this year we reached out to actually uh, one of our students' parents who offered and suggested, okay, we can develop a website for you. So it's something new that's not ready yet and not open yet. Uh, so Facebook works perfectly for us. And uh, the, the key is... Um, Put everything you do on your uh, social media platform. It doesn't matter if it is Twitter or uh, you know Facebook or maybe other fancy media, social media. But you do the art, you interact with other schools, or there is a mother language day performance. Um, you know the, the pictures from your adult classroom, what they do. Just put that hard work on display. It doesn't have to be in the faces of, of public every single day because I myself, I don't like when people put daily notices about what they did from the morning till evening. But once per week, once per two weeks, just to not overwhelm the viewers and to gain the followers. And then, you know, your community builds up. We are a tiny school, but I have like, I don't know, 170 followers of, of Facebook. Like much, my school is much smaller than that. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, Advertising. And then, of course, you have to reach out not only Facebook, not only Facebook, but newsletters, ELA newsletters mm -hmm. is one way of promoting uh, your school. Now, we have similar newsletter in, in not in Slovakia. I think this one is in, in Germany. It's called Ceruski Vosvete, which means pencils in the world when they promote Slovak schools all around the globe. And honestly, just by putting the things on Facebook page, uh, this lovely lady is contacting me, okay, can I put this in our newsletter? I'm like, of course. So even if I'm too busy to follow their newsletter, she gets in touch with me and she picks the things she wants for her newsletter. So mm -hmm. it's like a chain uh, of advertisement that you really fo uh, want for your for your school to happen. And of course, embassies. So we have Slovak embassy, you know, in Ottawa. And uh, I help to disseminate their messages. And if we did something crucial like Mother Language Day, I send information to them. So it's, again, it's networking. Don't, don't stay close to your own community. Just think globally and reach out to all schools out there and institutions because they want to promote you. They need to put something in their newsletters every week or month. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I'm sure you have very similar experience. Um, we do have similar experience. One of the things is we're also very tight. Like I told you before, we, we operate out of Nui Viet, which is the Viet, Vietnamese Association here in Edmonton. And they have a staff member. And so that staff member will often tell, parents will phone in and say, where could I find out about Vietnamese school for my children? And they will let people know what's available in the community. And so we will see students through them as well. It's a great opportunity to share. And likewise, um, we try and build their family populations as well because they're trying to keep their numbers up in the organization to maintain their building. So we, we try and make a, a mutually beneficial thing. And then we also have community events throughout the year. So we have a special autumn festival and a special New Year festival. Those are both very important to Vietnamese people. And so we make sure that we set up a display table at those events and we man the, the table. And when parents walk by, we tell them about our school. 
So those are other things that we do as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So here's our next question. What advice would you give to someone starting a new school? Oh yeah, uh, what advice? First of all, surround yourself with a dedicated people who give you energy. Don't surround yourself with people who hesitate, gives you doubts and question and say, oh, this is impossible to do. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you you need lots of energy to start and honestly i was at the time when i started the school i was at the point that um i wasn't sure if i should continue with my academic uh you know life or if i should just give up it was time a, a slot in my life when i wanted to try something in community um, and it was interesting, as soon as I opened the school, I get a full-time academic job, <laughs> mm -hmm. which complicated. Which very rare. Congratulations. But, 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 the, but the point was, point is, if I wasn't surrounded by this dedicated uh, group of people, uh, you know, who would give me energy, don't give up, don't give up, um, it, it wouldn't work. I started to work on it on myself. But then I needed the boost of energy, especially when you come across these big problems and big issues. I'm not a businessman. I don't have a degree in management. <laughs> so you learn these things step by step. And, uh, you know, it's very important to have a good team. It's essential for, for any institution to run. Mm -hmm. How about you, Trudy? What, would you, what is your piece of, uh, of advice? Well, I have, I have lots. But... One of, the, one of the things that you had talked about was you had mentioned um, not to be discouraged. And so one of the things that can easily happen is people can say, oh, our community tried to start a school 10 years ago and it failed. And I think that's true of every successful school. I think it's very rare that a school will start and will last for 75 years. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have, I think, maybe four or five of them in Edmonton, where they started one and and then for whatever reason, um, it managed to continue. So communities have ups and downs. Sometimes people get tired and they decide to not do it and sometimes the school falls apart, but there's always a rebirth and a chance to start again. And so those 75 year old schools, they probably had a school before them too. So never to be discouraged about that. I, I would say that if you are starting a new school, it's always helpful to talk to people who have done it before. Mm -hmm. So if that school happened 10 years ago and failed, if you can talk to the people who ran that school and find out some information about why they thought it failed, that will give you some insight into setting things up more successfully for yourself in the future. If your community is new to Edmonton, let's say you wanted to start a Somali school, we don't have one here, for example. Um, if you wanted to start a school and there's no community that can help you with that, then there's always the opportunity to come and talk to us at the International and Heritage Languages Association. Um, most of us have started a school or have been working in one and whatever issue you have, we will have some information about that. Um, especially paperwork. There's a little bit of paperwork that you need to do when you start a school. If you're starting a not-for-profit, um, one of the things you might want to do right from the start is set up your school as a not-for-profit. If you do that, then you'll be in a position where you can get funding later on. And so the longer time you are registered as a not-for-profit, the better chance you might have for casino funding and things like that. So it's always good to talk to to people and to seek their opinion and to see what they have to say. And I would say stay connected with ELA because they will be updating more webinars about these specific things, how to do the non-profit, step-by-step -step guidance. Right. So, well, thank you so much for talking with me today. Um, is there any- Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm very honored. Any, any final words that you'd like to share with our, our well, listeners? I just had a one last thought when you mentioned the rebirth. Yeah, this is actually my second attempt. Um, and yes, it's so true. You start, you fail. You know, you, you, you fall on your face, you get up 
and you do it again. So even if you realize that after you open your school, after first year, your numbers go down, don't worry about it. Step by step, you will, you will build it up. And I'm sure many other schools, Italian school went through this. Our school went through this. Your school, uh, Trudy, I'm sure experienced that. So don't get disappointed if after a year or, th or so, your, your numbers are going down. You will slowly build it up. But the, the, the most important thing is just do not give up. And part of it has to do also with the population, right? So mm -hmm. you it just might be the year where you have 60 Slovak kids that were born in Edmonton. <laughs> and the following year, there were no Slovak kids born in Edmonton. And so you get no kindergarten kids. We don't have the same pull from the population that a public school would have. So that's part of the reality too. So. Yes, yes. I agree. Thank you, Trudy, for this useful information. I, I, I hope people will benefit from it and hopefully we will see more schools uh, open in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care.